Section 1 of Abe and Morris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abe and Morris Being Further Adventures of Potash and Perlmutter by Montague Glass. Chapter 1 Sympathy. I come down on the subway with Max Linkheimer this morning, Morris. Abe Potash said to his partner, Morris Perlmutter, as they sat in the showroom one hot July morning, that fellow's a regular philanthropist. I betcha, Morris replied. He would talk a tin air onto you if only you give him a chance. Leon Sam it too, Abe, I assure you. I seen Leon in Harlem Winter Garden last night, and the goods he sold while he was talking to me and Barney Gantz, Abe, in two seasons we don't do such a business. Yes, Abe. Leon Samet is just such another one of them fellas like Max Linkheimer. What do you mean, such another one of them fellas like Max Linkheimer? Abe repeated. Between Leon Samet and Max Linkheimer is the difference like day from night. Max Linkheimer's one fine man, Morris. Morris shrugged. I didn't say he wasn't, he rejoined. All he says was that Leon Samet is another one of them philantho fellas too, Abe. Talk to you deaf, dumb, and blind. Abe rose to his feet and stared indignantly at his partner. "'I don't know what comes over you lately, Morris,' he cried. "'Seemingly you don't understand the English language at all. A philanthropist ain't a schmoozer, Morris.' "'I know he ain't, Abe. But just the same, Max Linkheimer is a fellow which he got a whole lot too much to say for himself. Furthermore, Abe, my Minnie says, Mrs. Linkheimer tells her, Max ain't home a single night neither, and when a man neglects his family like that, Abe, I ain't got no use for him at all. That's because he belongs to eight lodges, Abe replied. There ain't a single Sunday neither which he ain't busy with funerals too, Morris. Is that so? Morris retorted. Well, if I would be in the button business, Abe, I would be a philanthropist too. A fellow's got to belong to eight lodges if he's in the button business, Abe, because otherwise he couldn't sell no goods at all. Abe continued. Linkheimer ain't looking to sell goods to Lodge Brothers, Morris. He's too old established a business for that. He's got a heart, too, Morris. Why, the money that fellow spends on charity, Morris, you wouldn't believe it all. He told me so himself. Always he tries to do good. Only this morning, Morris, he was telling me about a young fellow by the name Shankman, which he's trying to find a position for as a stock clerk. Nobody would take the young feller on, Morris, because he got into trouble with a house in Dallas, Texas, which they claim the young feller stole from them a hundred dollars, Morris. But Linkheimer says, so how if you would give a dog a bad name, Morris, you might just as well give him to the dog catcher. So Linkheimer is willing to take a chance on this here feller, Shankman, and he gives him a job in his own place. Dogs I don't know nothing about at all, Abe, Morris commented. But I would be willing to give the young fellow a show, too, Abe. If only I got plain bone and metal buttons in stock. But when you carry a couple of hundred pieces of silk goods, Abe, like we do, then that's something else again. Well, Morris, God say dung. We don't got to get a new shipping clerk. Jake has been with us for five years now, Morris. And so far, what I could see, he ain't got no ambition enough to ask for even a raise, let alone look for a better job. You shouldn't congratulate yourself too quick, Abe. Morris replied. Ambition he's got a plenty, but he ain't got the nerve. We really ought to give that fellow a raise, Abe. I mean it. Every time I go near him at all, he gives me a look. And the first thing you know, Abe, he'd be leaving us. Looks, we can stand it, Morris. But if we would start in giving him a raise, there'd be no end to it at all. Last Blyben, if the fellow wants a raise, Morris, he should ask for it. Barely two weeks after the conversation above set forth however jake entered the firm's private office and tendered his resignation mr perlmutter he said i'm gonna leave gonna leave morris cried what do you mean gonna leave going to leave abe repeated crescendo an idea you should positively do nothing of the kind it wouldn't be no more than you deserve jake if we would fire you right out of the store Morris added. You work for us five years here, and then you come to us and say you're going to leave? Did you ever hear of such a thing? If you want a couple of dollars more a week, we'll be give it to you. 
and farthy but if you get fresh and come to us and tell us you're going to leave you understand and that's something else again must i work for you if i don't want to jake asked it's enough jake abe said we heard enough from you already all right mr potash he replied but just the same i'm telling you mr potash you should look for a new shipping clerk as i bought at a candy cigar and stationery store on lennox avenue and i'm going to quit saturday sure well late hey, what did i told you morris said bitterly after jake had left the office for the sake of a couple of dollars a week abe we're losing a good shipping clerk abe covered his embarrassment with a mirthless laugh good shipping clerks you can get any day of the week morris he said we ain't gonna go out of business exactly you understand just because jake is leaving us i bet you if we would advertise in tomorrow morning's paper we would get a dozen good shipping clerks go ahead advertise morris grunted this is your idea jake leaves us abe and now you should find somebody to take his place i'm sick and tired of making changes in the store always kicking morris always kicking abe retorted by saturday i bet you we would get a hundred good shipping clerks already but saturday came and went and although in the meantime old and young shipping clerks of every degree of uncleanliness passed in review before abe and morris none of them proved acceptable all right abe morris said on monday morning after jake had gone you done enough about this here shipping clerk business give me a show I ain't got such liberal ideas about shipping clerks as you got abe but all the same abe i think i can go at the business with a little system you understand you shouldn't trouble yourself morris abe replied with an airy wave of his hand i hired one already you hired one already abe morris repeated well ain't i got something to say about it too again kicking morris abe exclaimed you yourself told me i should find a shipping clerk and i done so well morris cried ain't i even titled to know the fellow's name at all sure you're entitled to know his name abe answered he's a young fellow by the name of shankman shankman morris said slowly shankman where did i you mean that fellow by the name shankman who he works with max linkheimer abe nodded what's the matter with you abe morris cried are you crazy or what what do you mean am i crazy abe said we carry burglary insurance ain't it and besides he ain't morris max linkheimer says missed so much as a button since the fellow worked for him a button morris shouted let me tell you something abe max linkheimer could miss a thousand buttons and what is it but with us abe one piece of silk goods is more a hundred dollars it's all right morris abe interrupted max linkheimer says we shouldn't be afraid he says he trusts the young feller in the office with hundreds of dollars laying in the safe and he ain't touched a cent so far furthermore the young feller's got a wife and a baby morris well i got a wife and baby too abe sure i know morris and so you oughta got a little sympathy for the fella huh morris laughed raucously sure i know abe he replied a good way to lose money in business abe is to get sympathy for somebody you sell a fella goods abe because he's a new beginner and you got sympathy for him abe and the fella busts up on you you accommodate a concern with five hundred dollars a check against their check dated two weeks ahead abe because their collections are slow and you got sympathy for them and when the two weeks goes by abe the check is it and g you give a feller out in kansas city two months in extension because he had done a bad spring business and you got sympathy for him and the first thing you know abe a jobber out in omaha gets a judgment against him and closes him up and that's the way it goes if you would hire this young fella because we got sympathy for him abe the least that happens to us is he gets away with a couple of hundred dollars worth of peace goods max langheimer says positively nothing of the kind abe insisted max says the fellow has turned around a new leaf and he would trust him like a brother like a brother-in-law you mean abe morris jeered that fellow linkheimer never trusted nobody for nothing abe always by the first of the month comes a statement and if you don't get checked by the fifth abe he sends another with past due stamped onto it so much the better morris if max linkheimer don't trust nobody morris and he lets this young fellow work in the store morris and the fellow must be okay ain't it morris rose wearily to his feet all right abe 
he said. If Linkheim is so anxious to get rid of this fellow, let him give us a recommendation in writing, you understand? And if I'm satisfied, we should give this here young Shanklin a trial. He could only get into us once at Abe. So go right over there and see Linkheimer. And if in writing he would give us a guarantee the fellow's honest, go ahead and hire him. Right away, I couldn't do it, Morris, Abe said. When I left Linkheimer in the subway this morning, he said he was going over to Newark, and he wouldn't be back till tonight. I'll stop in there first thing tomorrow morning. With this ultimatum, Abe proceeded to the back of the loft, and personally attended to the shipment of ten garments to a customer in Cincinnati. Under his supervision, a stock boy placed the garments in a wooden packing box, and after the first top board was in position, Abe took a wire nail and held it twixt his thumb and finger, point down on the edge of the case. Then he poised the hammer in his right hand, and carefully closing one eye, he gauged the distance between the upraised hammer and the head of the nail. At length the blow descended, and forthwith Abe commenced to dance around the floor in the newborn agony of a smashed thumb. It was while he was putting the finishing touches on a bandage that made up in bulk what it lacked in symmetry that Morris entered. "'What's the matter, Abe?' he cried. "'Did you hurt it yourself?' Abe transfixed his partner with a malevolent glare. "'No, Morris,' he said, as he started for the front of the store. "'I ain't hurted myself at all. I'm just tying this here handkerchief on my thumb to remind myself what a fool I got it for a partner.' Morris waited till Abe had nearly reached the door. "'I don't got to tie something on my thumb to remind myself of that, Abe,' he said." Ever since the birth of his son, it had seemed to Morris that the Lenox Avenue Express service had grown increasingly slow. Nor did the evening papers contain half the interesting news of his early married life, and he could barely wait until the train had stopped at 116th Street before he was elbowing his way to the platform. On the Monday night of his partner's mishap, he made his accustomed dash from the subway station to his home on 118th Street. Confident that as soon as his latchkey rattled in the door, Mrs. Perlmutter and the baby would be in the hall to greet him. But on this occasion he was disappointed. To be sure, the appetizing odor of Gedamkis cabflesh wafted itself down the elevator shaft as he entered the gilt and plaster periphery entrance from the street, but when he crossed the threshold of his own apartment, the robust wail of his son and heir mingled with the tones of Lena, the Slavic maid. Of Mrs. Perlmutter, however, there was no sign. "'Where's Minnie?' he demanded. "'Mrs. Perlmutter, she go out,' Lena announced. "'And she ain't come home yet.' Not since the return from their honeymoon had Minnie failed to be at home to greet her husband on his arrival from business and Morris was about to telephone a general alarm to police headquarters when the door bell rang sharply and Mrs. Perlmutter entered. Her hat, whose size and weight ought to have lent it stability, was tilted at a dangerous angle, and beneath its broad brim her eyes glistened with unmistakable tears. "'Minnie Laban!' Morris cried as he clasped her in his arms. "'What is it?' Sympathy only opened anew the floodgates of Mrs. Perlmutter's emotions, and before she was sufficiently calm to disclose the cause of her distress, the Gedampfkes Kabelfleisch gave evidence of its impending destruction by a strong odor of scorching. Hastily Mrs. Perlmutter dried her eyes and ran to the kitchen, so that it was not until the rescued dinner smoked on the dining-room table that Morris learned the reason for his wife's tears. "'Such a room, Morris,' Mrs. Perlmutter declared, "'like a pigsty, and not a crust of bread in the house. "'I met the poor woman in the meat market, "'and she tried to beg a piece of liver from that loafer Hirschkine. "'Not another cent of my money will he ever get. "'I bought a big piece of steak for her, and then I went home with her. "'Her poor baby, Morris, looked like a little skeleton.' Morris shook his head from side to side and made inarticulate expressions of commiseration through his nose. 
his mouth being temporarily occupied by about a half a pound of luscious veal. "'Her husband has a job for eight dollars a week,' she continued, "'and they have to live on that.' Morris swallowed the veal with an effort. "'In Rusland, he began, six people. "'I know,' Mrs. Perlmutter interrupted, "'but this is America, "'and you've got to go around with me right after dinner "'and see the poor people.' Morris shrugged his shoulders. "'If I must, I must.' he said, helping himself to more of the veal stew. But I could tell you right now, Minnie, I ain't got twenty-five cents in my clothes, so you gotta lend me a couple of dollars till Saturday. I'll cash a check for you, Mrs. Perlmutter said firmly, and as soon as dinner was concluded, Morris drew a check for ten dollars, and Mrs. Perlmutter gave him that amount out of her housekeeping money. It was nearly nine o'clock when Morris and Minnie groped along the dark alley of a tenement house in Park Avenue, on the iron viaduct that bestrides that deceptively named thoroughfare. Heavy trains thundered at intervals, and it was only after Morris had knocked repeatedly at the door of a top-floor apartment that its inmates heard the summons above the roar of the traffic without. "'Well, Mrs. Shankman,' Minnie cried cheerfully, "'how's the baby tonight?' "'Shankman,' Morris muttered. Shankman? Is that the name of them people? Why, yes, Minnie replied. Didn't I tell you that? Mrs. Shankman, this is my husband, and I suppose this is Mr. Shankman? A tall, gaunt person rose from the soapbox that did duty as a chair, and ducked his head shyly. Shankman? Morris repeated. You ain't the Shankman which he works by Max Linkheimer. Nathan Shankman nodded, and Mrs. Shankman groaned aloud. "'Ay, Zerus, she cried. "'For his sorrow he works by Max Linkheimer. Eight dollars a week he's supposed to get there, and Linkheimer makes us live here in this house. Twelve dollars a month we pay for the rooms, lady, and Linkheimer takes three dollars each week from Nathan's money. We couldn't even get dispossessed like some people does, and save a month's rent once in a while, maybe. The rooms ain't worth it, lady, believe me.' "'Does Max Linkheimer own this house?' Morris asked. Sure, he's the landlord, Mrs. Shankman went on. I'm just telling you, for eight dollars a week a man should work, ain't it a disgrace? Well, why doesn't he get another job? Morris inquired. And then, as Mr. and Mrs. Shankman exchanged embarrassed looks and hung their heads, Morris blushed. What a fine baby, he cried hurriedly. He chucked the infant under its chin and made such noises with his tongue as are popularly supposed by parents to be of a nature entertaining to very young children. In point of fact, the poor little Shankman child, with its blue-white complexion, looked more like a cold-storage chicken than a human baby. But to the maternal eye of Mrs. Shankman, it represented the sum total of infantile beauty. "'God bless you, mister,' she said. "'I seen you got it a good heart, and if you know Max Linkheimer, he must told you why my husband couldn't get another job. He tells everybody, lady, and makes him believe he gives my husband a job out of charity. So sure as I got a baby which I hope he will grow up to be a man, lady, my husband never took no money in Dallas. Them people give him a hundred dollars he should deposit in the bank, and he went and lost it. If he would stole it, he would have given it to me, lady, because my Nathan is a good man. He ain't no loafer that he should gamble it away." There was a ring of truth in Mrs. Shankman's tones, and as Morris looked at the twenty-eight years old Nathan, aged by ill-nutrition and abuse, his suspicions all dissolved and gave place only to a great pity. If he would stole it, he would have given it to me, lady. Don't say no more, Mrs. Shankman, he cried. I don't want to hear no more about it. Tomorrow morning, your man leaves that loafer Max Linkheimer and comes to work for us for eighteen dollars a week. Easily the most salient feature of Mr. Max Linkheimer's attire was the IOMA jewel that dangled from the tangent point of his generous waistline. It had been presented to him by Harmony Lodge 122 at the conclusion of his term of office as National Grand Corresponding Secretary and it weighed about eight ounces avoirdupois. 
not that the rest of mr linkheimer's wearing apparel was not in keeping for he affected to be somewhat old-fashioned in his attire with just a dash of bonhomie this implies that he wore a wrinkled frock coat and low-cut waistcoat but he had discarded the black string tie that goes with it for a white ready-made bow as being more suitable to the role of philanthropist the bonhomie he supplied by not buttoning the two top buttons of his waistcoat why hello abe my boy he cried all in one breath as abe potash entered his button wear rooms on tuesday morning what can i do for you he seized abe's right hand in a soft warm grip slightly moist and continued to hold it for the better part of five minutes i come to see you about shankman abe replied we decided we would have him come to work by us as a shipping clerk i'm glad to hear it said linkheimer as i told you the other day i have just been asked by our lodge i belong to if i could help out a young fellow just out of an orphan asylum he's a big strong healthy boy and he's willing to come to work for half what i'm paying shankman so naturally i've got to get rid of shankman i wonder how you got time to bother yourself breaking in a new beginner abe commented linkheimer waggled his head solemnly i can't help it abe he said i let my business suffer but nevertheless i'm constantly giving the helping hand to those poor inexperienced fellows i assure you it cost me thousands of dollars in a year but that's my nature abe i'm all heart when would you want shankman to come to work right away mr linkheimer very good i'll go and call him he rose to his feet and started for the door oh by the way abe he said as he paused at the threshold you know shankman is a married man with a wife and child and i understand mrs shankman is inclined to be extravagant for that reason i let him live in a house i own on park avenue and i take out the rent each week from his pay it's really a charity to do so this amount is uh, sixteen dollars a month i suppose you have no objection to sending me four dollars a week out of his wages well i ain't exactly a collecting agency you understand abe said but i'll see what my partner says if he's agreeable i am only one thing though mr linkheimer my partner bothers the life out of me but i should get from you a recommendation i'll give you one with pleasure abe linkheimer replied but it isn't necessary he returned to the front of the office and went to the safe why just look here abe he said i have here in the safe five hundred dollars and some small bills which i put in there last night after i come back from newark it was money i received the day before yesterday as chairman of the entertainment committee of a lodge i belong to the safe was unlocked from five to seven last night and shankman was in and out here all that time he opened the middle compartment and pulled out a roll of bills you see abe he said counting out the money here it is one hundred two hundred three hundred four hundred and here mr linkheimer paused and examined the last bill carefully for instead of a hundred dollar bill it was only a ten dollar bill well, what do you think of that dirty thief he cried at last that shankman has taken a hundred dollar bill out of here what abe exclaimed just as sure as you're sitting there linkheimer went on excitedly that fellow shankman has pinched a hundred dollar bill on me here his academic english completely forsook him and he continued in the vernacular of the lower east side always up to now i kept the safe locked on that fella and for the very first time i get careless he goes to work and does me four hundred dollars yet but abe protested he might have made a mistake ain't it if the fellow took it a hundred dollars why don't he turn around and convert the whole four hundred ain't it the ten dollars he also might have took it what i can't if he couldn't tell what he would do at all linkheimer rejoined and abe rose to his feet i'm sorry for you mr linkheimer he said seizing his hat but i guess i must be getting back to the store so you shouldn't trouble yourself about this here fellow shankman we decided we would get along without him but abe's words fell on deaf ears for as he turned to leave mr linkheimer threw up the window sash and thrust his head out police police he yelled when abe arrived at his place of business 
after his visit to Max Linkheimer, he found Morris whistling cheerfully over the morning mail. "'Well, Abe,' Morris cried, "'did you see it, Max Linkheimer?' Abe hurriedly took off his hat and coat, and, catching the bandaged thumb in the sleeve lining, he swore long and loud. "'Yes, I see Max Linkheimer,' he growled, "'and I'm sick and tired of the whole business. Go ahead and get a shipping clerk, Morris. I'm through.' "'Why?' Morris asked. "'Wouldn't Linkheimer give a recommendation? Because if you wouldn't, Abe, I'm satisfied we should take this fellow without one. In fact, I'm surprised you didn't bring him along.' "'You are, eh?' Abe broke in. Well, you shouldn't be surprised at nothing like that, Morris, because I didn't bring him along for the simple reason, Morris. I don't want no Ganef working round my place. That's all. What do you mean, Ganef? Morris cried. The feller ain't no more of a thief as you are, Abe. Abe's mustache bristled, and his eyes bulged so indignantly that they seemed to rest on his cheeks. You should be careful what you say, Morris, he retorted. Maybe he ain't no more a Ganef as I am, Morris, but just the same, he's in jail and I ain't. In jail? Morris exclaimed. What for in jail? Because he stole from Linkheimer a hundred dollars yesterday, Morris, and while I was here yet, Linkheimer finds it out, so naturally he makes this here fella arrested. Yesterday he stole a hundred dollars? Morris interrupted. Yesterday afternoon, Abe repeated. With my own eyes I seen it the other money which he didn't stole. Then, Morris said, if he stole it yesterday afternoon, Abe, he didn't positively do nothing of the kind. Forthwith he related to Abe his visit to Shankman's rooms and the condition of poverty that he found. I give you my word, Abe, he said, the fellow didn't got even a chair to sit on. What do you know, Morris? What he got to do and what he didn't got? Abe rejoined impatiently. The fella naturally ain't going to show you the hundred dollars which he stole it, especially, Morris, if he thinks he could work for you for a couple of dollars more. Say, looky here, Abe, Morris broke in. Don't say again the fella stole a hundred dollars, because I'm telling you once more, Abe, I know he didn't take nothing, certain sure. Gavek, Morris, Abe cried disgustedly. You talk like a fool. Do I? Morris shouted. All right, Abe, maybe I do, and maybe I don't, but just the same. So positive I am, he didn't done it. I'm going right down to Henry D. Feldman, and I will fix that fellow Linkheimer. He should work a poor half-starved yokel for five dollars a week and a couple of top-floor tenement rooms, which it ain't worth six dollars a month. Wait, I'll show that sucker. He seized his hat and made for the elevator door, which he had almost reached when Abe grabbed him by the arm. Morris, he cried, are you crazy? What for you should put yourself out about this here young fella? He ain't the last shipping clerk in existence. You could get plenty good shipping clerks without bothering yourself like this. Besides, Morris, if he did steal it or if he didn't steal it, what difference does it make to us? With the silk piece goods which we got it around our place, Morris, we couldn't afford it to take no chances. I ain't taking no chances, Abe. Morris maintained stoutly. I know this feller ain't took the money. Sure, that's all right, Abe agreed. But you couldn't afford to be away all morning right in the busy season. Besides, Morris, since when did you become to be so charitable all of a sudden? Me? Charitable? Morris cried indignantly. I ain't charitable, Abe. Good so hootin'. I leave that to suckers like Max Linkheimer. But when I know a decent, respectable feller's being put into jail for something which he didn't do at all, Abe, then that's something else again. At this juncture, the elevator arrived, and as he plunged in, he shouted that he would be back before noon. Abe returned to the rear of the loft, where a number of rush orders had been arranged for shipment. Under his instruction and supervision, the stock boy nailed down the top boards of the packing cases. But... In nearly every instance, after the case was strapped and stenciled, they discovered they had left one garment out, and the whole process had to be repeated. Thus it was nearly one o'clock before Abe's task was concluded. And although he had breakfasted late that morning, when he looked at his watch he became suddenly famished. I could starve yet, he muttered, for all that fellow cares. 
he walked up and down the showroom floor in an ecstasy of imaginary hunger and as he was making the hundredth trip the elevator door opened and max lingheimer stepped out his low-cut waistcoat disclosed that his shirt front ordinarily of a glossy white perfection had fallen victim to a profuse perspiration even his collar had not escaped the flood and as for his ioma charm it seemed positively tarnished say looky here potash he began what do you mean by sending your partner to bail out that ganif me send my partner out to bail a ganif abe exclaimed what are you talking nonsense i ain't talking nonsense linkheimer retorted look at the kinds of conditions i'm in that fellow feldman made a fine monkey out of me in the police court was feldman there too abe asked you don't know i suppose feldman was there linkheimer continued and your partner went on his bail for two thousand dollars abe shrugged his shoulders in the first place mr linkheimer he said i didn't tell my partner he should do nothing of the kind he done it against my advice mr linkheimer but at the same time mr linkheimer if he wants to go bail for that fellow you understand what's it my business what's it your business linkheimer repeated why don't you know if that feller runs away the sheriff could come in here and clean out your place that's all what abe cried he sat down in the nearest chair and gaped at linkheimer yes sir linkheimer repeated you could be ruined by a thing like that abe's lower jaw fell still further he was too dazed for comment what could i do about it he gasped at length do about it linkheimer cried why if i had a partner who played me a dirty trick like that i'd kick him out of my place there ain't a co-partnership agreement in existence that doesn't expressly say one partner shouldn't give a bail bond without the other partner's consent abe rocked to and fro in his chair after all these years a fellow should do a thing like that to me he moaned linkheimer smiled with satisfaction and he was about to instance a striking and wholly imaginary case of one partner ruining another by giving a bail bond when the door leading to the cutting room in the rear opened and morris perlmutter appeared as his eyes rested on linkheimer they blazed with anger and for once morris seemed to possess a certain dignity out he commanded out from mine store you dog you as he rushed on the startled button dealer abe grabbed his coat tails and pulled him back say what are we here morris he cried the theatre let him alone abe linkheimer counseled in a rather shaky voice i'm pretty nearly twenty years older than he is but i guess i can cope with him you wouldn't cope with nobody around here abe replied if you still want to cope you should go out on the sidewalk never mind morris broke in his valor now quite evaporated i'll fix him yet another thing morris abe interrupted why don't you come in the front way like a man i come in which way i please abe morris rejoined and furthermore abe when i got with me a poor skeleton of a fellow like nathan shankman abe i don't take him up the front elevator i'd be ashamed for our competitors that they should think we let our work people starve the feller actually fainted on me as coming up the freight elevator as you was coming up the freight elevator abe repeated do you mean to tell me you got the nerve to actually bring this fella into my place yet do i gotta get your permission abe i should bring who i want into my own place morris rejoined and all i got to say is you should take him right out again abe said i wouldn't have no gun of him in my place once and for all morris i'm telling you i wouldn't stand for your nonsense you are giving our stock as a bail for this fella if he runs away on us the sheriff comes in and who says i give our stock as a bail for this fella morris demanded i got a surety company bond abe because feldman says i shouldn't go on no bail bonds i give the surety company my personal check for a thousand dollars which they will return when the case is over that's why i done it to keep this here shankman out of jail abe and if it would be necessary to get their linkheimer into jail abe i would have another check for a thousand dollars for keeps abe grew somewhat abashed at this disclosure he looked at linkheimer and then at morris but before he could think of something to say the elevator door opened and jake stepped out it was perhaps the first time in all their acquaintance with jake that abe and morris had seen him with his face washed 
Moreover, a clean collar served further to conceal his identity, and at first Abe did not recognize his former shipping clerk. "'Hello, Mr. Potash,' Jake said. "'I'll be with you in a moment, Mr. Uh, Abe began. Just take a—' "'Why, that's Jake, ain't it?' Here he saw a chance for a conversational diversion, and he jumped excitedly to his feet. "'What's the matter, Jake?' he asked. "'You want your old job back?' "'It don't go so quick as all that, Mr. Potash,' Jake answered. "'I got a good business, Mr. Potash. I carry a fine line of cigars, candy and stationery, and already I got an offer twenty-five dollars more as I paid for the business. But I wouldn't take it. Why should I? I took in a lot of money yesterday, and only this morning, Mr. Potash, a fella comes in my place, and why, there's the fella now. Fella? What do you mean, fella? Abe cried indignantly. That ain't no fella. That's Mr. Max Linkheimer. Sure, I know, Jake explained. He's the fella, I mean. Half an hour ago, I was in his place, and they says, there, he comes up here. You was in my store this morning, Mr. Linkheimer, ain't that right? And you bought for me a package of all tobacco cigarettes. New, no, new, no, Jake, Morris broke in. Make an end. You're interrupting us here. Jake drew back his coat and clumsily unfastened a large safety pin, which sealed the opening of his upper right-hand waistcoat pocket. Then he dug down with his thumb and finger and produced a small yellow wad about the size of a postage stamp. Then he proceeded to unfold it, took on the appearance of a hundred-dollar bill. He gives me this here, Jake announced, and I give him the change for a ten-dollar bill. So this here is a hundred-dollar bill, ain't it? And it don't belong to me. Which I come downtown, I should give it back to him. What isn't mine, I don't want it all. This was perhaps the longest speech that Jake had ever made, and he paused to lick his dry lips for peroration. And so, he concluded, handing the bill to Linkheimer, here it is, and nine dollars and ninety-nine cents, please. Linkheimer grabbed the bill automatically and gazed at the figures on it with bulging eyes. Why, Abe gasped, why, Linkheimer, you had four one-hundred-dollar bills and a ten-dollar bill in the safe this morning, ain't it? Linkheimer nodded. Once more, he broke into a copious perspiration as he handed a ten-dollar bill to Jake. And so, Abe went on, and so you must have took a hundred-dollar bill out of the safe last night instead of a ten-dollar bill, ain't it? Linkheimer nodded again. And so you made a mistake, ain't it? Abe cried. And this here fella Shankman didn't took no money out of that safe at all, ain't it? For the third time, Linkheimer nodded, and Abe turned to his partner. What do you think of that fella? He said, nodding his head in Linkheimer's direction. Morris shrugged, and Abe plunged his hands into his trouser pockets and glared at Linkheimer. So, Linkheimer, he concluded, you made a sucker out of yourself and of me too, ain't it? I'm sorry, Abe, Linkheimer muttered as he folded away the hundred-dollar bill in his wallet. I bet you he's sorry, Morris interrupted. I'd be sorry too if I would got a lawsuit on my hands like he's got it. What do you mean, Linkheimer cried. I ain't got no lawsuit on my hands. Not yet. Morris said significantly, but when Feldman hears of this, you would quick get a summons for a couple of thousand dollars damages, which you done this young fella Shankman by making him false arrested. It ain't no more than you deserve, Linkheimer, Abe added. You're lucky I don't sue you for trying to make trouble between me and my partner yet. For one brief moment, Linkheimer regarded Abe sorrowfully. There were few occasions to which Linkheimer could not do justice with a cut-and-dried sentiment or a well-worn aphorism, and he was about to expatiate on ingratitude in business when Abe forestalled him. Another thing I want to say to you, Linkheimer, Abe said, you shouldn't wait until the first of the month to send us a statement. Mail it tonight yet, because we give you notice we close your account right here and now. One week later, Abe and Morris watched Nathan Shankman driving nails into the top of a packing case with a force and precision of which Jake had been wholly incapable. For seven days of better housing and better feeding had done wonders for Nathan. Yes, Abe, Morris said as they turned away. 
I think we made a find in that boy. And we also done a charity, too. Some people's got an idea, Abe, that business is always business. But with me, I think differently. You can never make no big success in business unless you got it a little sympathy for a fellow once in a while, ain't it? Abe nodded. I give you right, Mars, he said. End of chapter one. Section 2 of Abe and Morris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abe and Morris. Being Further Adventures of Potash and Perlmutter. By Montague Glass. Chapter 2. The Judgment of Paris. There was an intimate connection between Abe Potash's advent in the lobby of the Prince Clarence Hotel one hot summer day in June, and the publication in that morning's Arrival of Buyers column of the following statement and news item. Greaseman, M., Dry Goods Company, Syracuse. M. Greaseman, Ladies and Mrs. Cloaks, Suits, Waists, and Furs, Prince Clarence Hotel. Nevertheless, when Abe caught sight of Mr. Greaseman lolling in one of the hotel's capacious fauteuils, he quickly looked the other way and passed on to the clerk's desk. Then he asked in a loud tone for Mr. Elkin Reinberg of Boonton, New Jersey, and almost before the clerk told him that no such person was registered, he turned about and recognized Mr. Greaseman with an elaborate start. "'Why, how do you do, Mr. Greaseman?' he exclaimed. "'Ain't it a pleasure to see you. What are you doing here in New York?' Greaseman looked hard at his interlocutor before replying. Some two years earlier, there had been an acrimonious correspondence between them, with reference to a shipment of skirts lost in transit, a correspondence ending in threatened litigation and Mr. Greaseman had transferred his account with Potash and Perlmutter to Samet Brothers. Hence he regarded Abe's proffered hand coldly. Instead of rising to his feet, he continued to puff at his cigar for a few moments. "'I know your face,' he said at length. "'But your name ain't familiar.' "'Think again, Mr. Greaseman,' Abe said, quite unmoved by the rebuff. "'Where did you see me before?' I think I seen you in a law office once, it, Greaseman said. To the best of my recollection, the occasion was one which you said you didn't give a damn about my business at all, and if I wouldn't pay for the skirts, you would make it hot for me. But, so far what I hear it, I ain't paid for the skirts, and didn't sweat none neither. Why not let bygones be bygones, Mr. Greaseman? Abe rejoined. I ain't got no bygones, Abe, Greaseman replied. The bygones is all on your side. I ain't got the skirts, so I didn't pay for em. Well, what is a few skirts that fellows should be enemies about em, Mr. Greaseman? The skirts is vor by, shown along since already. Why don't you anyhow come down to our place once in a while and see us, Mo? What would I do in your place, Abe? You still use a couple of garments like we make it in your business, Mo? Abe continued. You gotta buy goods in New York once in a while, ain't it? Well, I do and I don't, Abe, Mo rejoined. I ain't the back number which I once it used to was, Abe. I got fresh ideas a little too, Abe. Nowadays, Abe, a briar couldn't rely on his own judgment at all. Before he buys a new season's goods, he's got to find out what they're wearing on the other side first. So with me, Abe, I go first to Paris, Abe. Then I see there what I want to buy here, Abe, and when I come back to New York, I buy only them goods which has got the ideas I seen it in Paris. But how do you know we ain't got the ideas you had seen it in Paris, Mo? I don't know, Abe, Mo replied, because I ain't been to Paris yet so far. I am now on my way over to Paris, Abe, and furthermore, Abe, if I would been to Paris, you understand what does a fellow like Morris know about designing? "'What do you mean, what does a fellow like Morris know about designing?' Abe repeated. "'Don't you fool yourself, Mo. 
morris is a first-class a number one designer he gets his ideas straight from the best fashion journals then tumo when it comes to up-to-date styles i ain't such a big fool neither you understand i know one or two things about designing myself mo and you could take it from me mo there ain't no house in the trade mo which they got better facilities for giving you the latest up to the minute style like we got it sure i know mo continued but as i told you before abe i ain't in the market for my fall goods now i am now only on my way to paris and when i would come back it would be time for you to waste your breath i could waste my breath all i want to mo abe rejoined i ain't like some people mo my breath don't cost me nothing what do you mean mo cried indignantly he had allowed himself the unusual indulgence of a cocktail that morning as a corollary to a rather turbulent evening with leon sammet and he had been there absently chewing a clove throughout the interview with abe i mean Jaime Salzman, designer for Samet Brothers, Abe replied. There's a fellow which he got at such a breath, Mo, he ought to put a revenue stamp on his chin. That may be, Abe, but the fellow delivers the goods. Samet Brothers are sending him to Paris this year, too, Abe. He's sailing with Leon Samet on the same ship with me, Abe. Well, then all I can say to you is, Mo, you should look out for yourself, and don't play no auction pinnacle with that fellow every afternoon he's playing with such sharks like mo rabiner and mark spasinski if he ever got out of a job as a designer he can go on the stage and one of them continual performances as a card juggler yet a three fifty hand is the least that fella deals himself one thing is sure abe you could never sell me no goods by knocking Jaime salzman i ain't trying to sell you no goods mo i'm only talking to you like an old friend should talk to another when are you coming back about july one i should be here mo replied and if you want to come and see me like an old friend abe you are welcome only i gotta say this to you abe i forgot them skirts long since ago already and i wish you the same when abe entered his showroom that morning morris perlmutter had just arranged a high neck evening gown on a wire model well abe what do you think of it he exclaimed proudly as he wiped his glistening brow Abe fingered the garment's silken folds and puffed critically at a black cigar. "'What could I think, Morris?' he replied. "'The garment looks all right, Morris, and it ain't kicking, you understand? But I tell you the honest truth, Morris, the way things is nowadays, Morris. A fella could be Elijah the Prophet already, and he couldn't tell in June what's going to please the garment buyers in September.' Morris flushed angrily. I don't know what comes over you lately, Abe. Nothing suits you, he cried. I got here a garment which, if we would be paying a designer ten thousand dollars a year yet, he couldn't turn us out nothing better. And yet you're kicking. What do you mean, kicking? Abe rejoined. I ain't kicking. I'm only passing a remark, Morris. I am saying I couldn't tell nothing about it, Morris, because so far ahead of time like this, Morris, a garment could look ever so rotten, Morris, and it could turn out to be record seller anyhow. So, Abe, Morris broke out furiously. You think the garment looks rotten? What? Well, all I gotta say is this, Abe. If the garment looks so rotten, you should quick hire someone which could design a better one, because I am sick and tired of your kicking. "'What's the matter? You got pepper up your nose all of a sudden, Morris?' Abe protested. "'I ain't saying nothing about the garment is rotten. I'm only saying it gets so nowadays that in June a fella turns out a style which, if we was making masquerade costumes already, it would be freaky anyhow. And yet, Morris, it would go big in September. You get the idea what I'm talking about, Morris?' "'I get the idea all right,' Morris retorted with bitter emphasis. You got the nerve to stand there and tell me this here garment is freaky like a masquerade costume. Sean Gook, Abe, from now on I wash myself of the whole thing. I am through, Abe. You should right away advertise for a designer. Abe rose wearily to his feet. With a touchy proposition like you, Morris, he said, a fellow couldn't open his mouth at all. I ain't saying nothing about you as a designer, Morris. All I'm saying, Morris, is a designer could be a fella which he has so high grade like Paquin or any of them Frenchers, but when he gets his ideas from fashion papers 
ordered the daily cloak and soup gazette morris and once in a while he turns out a stecker morris was stripping the garment from the display form but he paused to favor his partner with a glare what do you want me to do then he asked make up styles out of my own head abe if i wouldn't get my ideas from the fashion papers abe where would i get em where would you get em abe repeated why where does Jaime salzman designer for samet brothers and charles eisenblum designer for klinger and klein get their ideas morris this was purely a rhetorical question but as abe paused to heighten the effect of the peroration morris undertook to supply an answer them suckers don't get their ideas abe they steal em if a concern gets a run on a certain garment abe them two high be robbers make up a duplicate of it before you could turn around your head that's the kind of cutthroat some fellas is abe sure i know abe continued but they got to turn out some garments of their own morris and they get their ideas right from headquarters they get their ideas from paris morris only this morning i hear it that Jaime saltzman sails for paris on saturday well i couldn't stop em abe morris commented sure i know morris abe went on but things is very quiet here in the store morris and for a month yet we wouldn't do hardly no business i could get along here all right until say july fifteenth anyhow for two minutes morris looked hard at his partner what are you driving at abe he asked at length why i'm driving into this morris abe continued why don't you go to paris me go to paris morris exclaimed why not abe murmured the suggestion did seem preposterous after all why not morris repeated there's a whole lot of reasons why not abe and the first and foremost is that the atlantic ocean we got to run dry and they got to build a railroad there first abe i crossed the water just once it abe and i wouldn't cross it again if i never sold another dollar's worth more goods so long as i live abe and that's all there is to it what are you talking nonsense morris one of them big boats like the morrisania there ain't no more motion than if a fellow would be going to coney island morris that's all right abe morris replied firmly me if i would go to coney island i'm taking always the trolley abe new york side of the bridge furthermore abe if samet brothers sends a trinker like Jaime salzman to paris abe they got a right to spend their money the way they want to but all i got to say is that we shouldn't be afraid they would cop out any of our trade on that account abe i mean would come home with new ideas of champagne or wine and not garments abe sure i know morris abe retorted but if you go over to paris morris you would come back with some new ideas which you would turn out some real snappy stuff morris as it is morris with a sticker like you got it there morris we would ruin our business all right abe i heard enough you got altogether too much to say for a fellow which comes downtown at ten o'clock with no excuses nor nothing at this point abe interrupted his partner long enough to relate his visit to mo greaseman but the information entirely failed to placate morris all right abe he shouted why don't you go to paris that's all you're fit for i got a wife and baby abe but with a fellow which he's got no more interest in home you understand than he wants to go to paris abe all right go ahead abe go to paris i'm satisfied abe regarded his partner for one hesitating moment sean good i will go to paris he said and the next moment the elevator door closed behind him for five minutes after abe's departure morris gazed earnestly at his newest creation he had intended the model as a pleasant surprise to his partner since not only had he conceived the garment to be a triumph of the dressmaker's art but it had been finished far in advance of the season for originating new styles he had confidently expected an enthusiastic reception of this chef de vore, but in view of abe's scathing criticism he commenced to doubt his own estimate of the beauty of the dress indeed the longer he looked at it the uglier it appeared until at length he grabbed it roughly and literally tore it from the wire form he had rolled it into a ball and was about to cast it into a corner when the elevator door opened and a young lady stepped out good morning mr perlmutter she said 
Morris turned his face in the direction of the speaker, and at once his mouth expanded into a broad grin. "'Why, Miss Smith!' he exclaimed, as he rushed forward to greet her. "'How do you do? Me and Mrs. Perlmutter was just talking about you today. How much you think that boy weighs now?' Sixteen pounds,' Miss Smith replied. Twenty-two, Morris cried. "'Net!' "'You don't say,' said Miss Smith. "'We got to thank you for that, Miss Smith,' Morris continued. "'The doctor says without you anything could happen.' Miss Smith deprecated this compliment to her professional skill with a smiling shake of the head. "'We wouldn't forget it in a hurry,' Morris declared. "'Everything what that boy is today, Miss Smith, we owe it to you.' "'You're making it hard for me, Mr. Perlmutter.' Miss Smith replied, because I've come to ask you a favor. A favor? Morris replied. You couldn't ask me to do you a favor because it wouldn't be no favor. It would be a pleasure. What could I do for you? I have to leave town tomorrow on a case, Miss Smith explained, and I need a dress in a hurry, something light for evening wear. Morris frowned perplexedly. That's too bad, he said because just at present we got nothing but last year's goods in stock, all except, uh, all except this. He unfolded the model and shook it out. What a pretty dress, Miss Smith cried, clasping her hands. Pretty, Morris exclaimed. How could you say it was pretty? It's perfectly stunning, Miss Smith continued. What size is it, Mr. Perlotter? The usual size. Morris replied, thirty-six. Why, that's just my size, Miss Smith declared. Let me see it. Morris handed her the dress, and she examined it carefully. What a pity, she said. It has a slight rip in front. Somebody's been handling it carelessly. Sure, I know, Morris said. I tore it myself, Miss Smith. But if you really and truly like it, Miss Smith, which I tell you the truth, I don't, and my partner neither, you're welcome to it and I would give you a little piece from the same goods which you could fix up the rip with. I couldn't think of it, Miss Smith replied. Not at all, Miss Smith. You would do me a favor if you'd take it along with you right now. Miss Smith fairly beamed as she opened her handbag. How much is it? She asked. How much is it? Morris repeated. Why, Miss Smith, you could take that dress only on one condition. The condition is that you wouldn't pay me nothing for it that next fall, when we really got something in stock, you would come in and pick out as many of our highest-priced garments as you would want. Morris's hand shook so with this unusual access of generosity that he could hardly wrap up the garment. Also, Miss Smith, I expect you will come up and have dinner with us, as soon as you get back from wherever you're going. Already the baby commences to recognize people which he meets, and we want him. He should never forget you, Miss Smith. The cordiality with which Morris ushered Miss Smith into the elevator was in striking contrast to the brusque manner in which he greeted Abe half an hour later. No, he growled. Who was he now? By the steamship office, Abe replied. I'm going next Saturday. Going next Saturday, Morris repeated. Where to? To Paris, Abe replied on the same ship with Mo Griesman, Leon Samet, and Jaime Salzman. Morris nodded slowly as the news sank in. Well, all I could say, Abe, he commented at length, that I don't wish you and the other passengers no harm, you understand? But with them three suckers on board the ship, I hope it sinks. The five days preceding Abe's departure were made exceedingly busy for him by Morris who soon became reconciled to his partner's fashion-hunting trip, particularly when he learned that Mo Griesman formed part of the quarry. "'You gotta remember one thing, Abe,' he declared. "'Extremes is next. Let the other fellow buy the freaks. What we are after is something in moderation.' "'You shouldn't worry about that, Morris,' Abe replied. "'I wouldn't bring you home no such model like you showed at me this week.' "'You'd be lucky if you wouldn't bring home worse yet.' Morris retorted. But anyhow, then eat the point. I got here the names of a couple of commission men, which it is their business to look out for greenhorns. What do you mean, greenhorn? Abe cried indignantly. I ain't no greenhorn. That's all right, 
Morris went on. In France, only the Frenchers ain't greenhorns. You ain't told me what kind of stateroom you got it. Well, the outside room's one hundred and twenty-five dollars, and the inside room was eighty-five dollars, Abe explained. So I took an inside room, because the light wouldn't come in and wake me up so early in the morning, Morris, and forty dollars is as good to me as it is to them suckers what runs the steamboat company, ain't it? Nevertheless, when Abe found himself in his upper berth, the morning after he had parted with Minnie, Rosie, and Morris at the pier, he had reason to regret his economy. He shared his stateroom with a singer of minor operatic roles, who, as a souvenir of a farewell luncheon ashore, carried into that narrow precinct an odor of garlic that persisted for the entire voyage. In addition, the returning artist smoked Egyptian cigarettes and anointed his generous head of hair with violet brilliantine. Hence it was not until the boat was passing Browhead that Abe staggered up the companionway to the promenade deck. "'Why, hello, Abe!' cried a bronzed and bulky figure. "'I ain't seen you for almost a week.' "'No,' Abe murmured. "'Well, if you had wanted to see me, Leon, you know where you could find me. Just below the pantry my stateroom was inside. A dog shouldn't got to live in such a place.' At this juncture Saltzman appeared to summon his employer to a game of auction pinochle in the smoking-room, and as Abe started to make a feeble promenade around the deck-house, he encountered Mo Greisman. After Mo had taken Abe's hand in a limp clasp, he nodded in the direction of the smoking-room. "'What do you think of them two suckers?' he croaked. "'They ain't missed a meal since they came aboard.' "'What could you expect from a couple of tough propositions like that?' Abe replied. "'Was you sick, Mo?' "'Sick!' Greaseman exclaimed. "'I give you my word, Abe. Last Thursday night I was so sick that I commenced to figure out already how much I would have saved in premiums if my insurance policies would be straight life instead of endowment. No, Abe, this here business of going to Paris for your styles ain't what it's cracked up to be.' Always up to now, I got fine weather crossing. But the way the water's been the last six days, Abe, I'm beginning to think I could get just so good ideas of the season's models right here in New York. You know, Mo, said Abe, I'm starting to feel hungry. I wish that fellow with the chauffeur would come. Hardly had he spoken when the ship's bugler announced luncheon. But it was some minutes before Mo could summon up sufficient courage to go below to the dining saloon and when they entered they found leon sammet and Jaime saltzman had nearly concluded their meal steward leon shouted as mo sat down next to him bring me a nice piece of camembert cheese one moment leon greaseman interrupted if you bring that stuff under my nose here i would never buy from you a dollar's worth more goods so long as i live that fella goes too far, Abe, he said, after Leon had cancelled the order and departed to drink his coffee in the smoking room. That fella goes too far. Yesterday afternoon I was sitting on deck, and the way I felt, Abe, my worst enemy wouldn't got to feel it. Do you believe me, Abe, that fella got the nerve to offer me a cigar yet? It pretty near finished me up. He only done it out of spite, Abe, but I fooled him. I took the cigar and I got it in my pocket right now. Don't show me, Abe cried hurriedly. I'll tell you the truth. There ain't nothing in the smoking habit. I'm going to cut it out. Waiter, bring me only a plate of clear soup and some dry toast. There ain't no need for a fellow to smoke, Mo. It's only an extra expense. I think you're right, Abe, Mo said. But I know that this here cigar cost Leon a quarter on board ship here, and I thought... I would show him he shouldn't get so gay. Despite Abe's resolution, however, a large black cigar protruded from his mustache when he stood on the wharf at Cherbourg twenty-four hours later, and a small, ill-shaven stevedore, clad in a dark blouse and shabby corduroy trousers, pointed to the cloud of smoke that issued from Abe's lips and chattered a voluble protest. What does he say, Mo? I don't know. 
Mo replied. He's talking French. French? Abe exclaimed. What are you trying to do, kid me? A dirty schlemiel of a greenhorn like him should talk French? What an idea. Nevertheless, Abe was made to throw away his cigar, and it was not until the quartet were snugly enclosed in a first-class compartment en route to Paris that Abe felt safe to indulge in another cigar. He explored his pockets without result. Mo, he said, you got maybe another cigar on you. I'm smoking the one which Leon gave at me on the ship the other day, Mo replied. Leon, be a good fella. Give him a cigar. I give you my word, Mo. This is the last one, Leon replied as he bit the end off of a huge invincible. You got something there bulging in your vest pocket, Abe. Why don't you smoke it? That ain't a cigar, Abe answered. That's a fountain pen. Smoke it anyhow, Leon advised because the only cigars you can get on this train is French government cigars, and I'd sooner tackle a fountain pen as one of them rolls of spinach. That's a country, Abe commented. Couldn't even get a decent cigar here. In Paris you can get plenty good cigars, Jaime Salzman said. And Jaime was right, for at the Guerre saint Lazare, Monsieur Adolphe Kaufmann Levi, commissionaire, awaited them his pockets literally spilling red-banded perfectos at every gesture of his lively fingers. Monsieur Kaufmann Levi spoke English, French, and German, with every muscle of his body from the waist up. "'Welcome to France, Mr. Potish,' he said. "'You had a good voyage, doubtless, because you Americans are born sailors.' "'Maybe we are born sailors,' he admitted. "'But I must have grown out of it. I'll tell the honest truth.' If I could go back by trolley and it took a year, I would do it. The weather is always more settled in July than in August, said Monsieur Kaufman Levi, and I wouldn't worry about the return trip just now. I have rooms for all you gentlemen, or on one floor of a hotel near the opera. Taxi meters are in waiting. After you have settled, we will take dinner together. Thus it happened that at half past six that evening, Monsieur Kaufman Levi conducted his four guests from the restaurant Morgery to a sidewalk table of the Café de la Paix, and for almost an hour they watched the crowd making its way to the opera. You see, Mo, Abe said, everything's as tunics this year. Tunics, so de chiffon, overskirts, neck collars, and yokes. Mo nodded absently. His eyes were glued to a lady sitting at the next table. You gotta come to Paris to see him, Abe, he murmured. They don't make them like that in America. We make as good garments in America as anywhere, he protested. Garments I ain't talking about at all, Mo whispered hoarsely. I mean peaches. Did you ever see anything like that lady there sitting next to you? Look at that get-up, Abe. Ain't it chic? It's a pretty good-looking model, Mo, Abe replied, but a bit too plain for us. See all the fancy-looking garments there are around here? Plain nothing, Mo muttered. Look at the way it fits her. I tell you, Abe, the French ladies know how to wear their clothes. A moment later, the couple at the next table passed along toward the opera, and once more, Abe and Mo turned their attention to the crowds on the boulevard. For the remainder of their stay in Paris, Abe and Leon spent their time in a ceaseless hunt for new models, and their nights in plying Mo Griesman with entertainment. It cannot be said that Mo discouraged them to any marked degree, for while he occasionally hinted to Abe that the New York cloak and suit trade was an open market, and garment buyers had a large field from which to choose, he also told Leon that he saw no reason why he should not continue to buy goods from Samet Brothers provided the prices were right. Nearly every evening found them sitting at the corner table of the Café de la Paix, and upon many of these occasions the next table was occupied by the same couple that sat there on the night of Abe's arrival in Paris. You know, Abe, that dress is the most uniquest thing in Paris, Mo exclaimed on the evening of the last day in Paris. I ain't seen nothing like it anywhere. "'Good reason, Mo,' Leon Samet cried. "'It's rotten. That's one of last year's models.' "'What are you talking nonsense, one of last year's models?' 
mo griesman cried indignantly don't you think i know a new style when i see it mo is right leon abe said i ain't got no business to talk that way at all the style is this year's model of course abe leon said with ironic precision when a judge like you says something you understand then it's so take another of them uh, sixty cent ice creams mo ordinarily abe would have turned leon's sarcasm with a retort in kind but leon's remark fell on deaf ears for abe was listening to a conversation at the next table and the language was english it's time to start back to the hotel said the young lady to her escort who was an elderly gentleman abe turned to mo and leon excuse me for a few minutes he said i gotta go back to the hotel for something he handed leon a twenty franc piece if i shouldn't get back pay the bill he cried and jumping to his feet he followed the couple from the next table the old gentleman walked feebly with the aid of a cane and the young lady helped him by the arm as they proceeded to the main entrance of the grand hotel abe dogged their footsteps until the old gentleman disappeared into the lift and the young lady retired to the winter garden that forms the interior court of the hotel as she seated herself in a wicker chair abe approached with his hat in his hand lady excuse me he began i ain't no loafer i'm in the cloak and suit business and i would like to speak to you a few words something very particular the young lady turned in her chair she was not alarmed only surprised i hope you don't think i'm asking you anything out of the way abe said without further prelude but you got a dress on lady which i don't know how much you paid for it but if three hundred of these here now francs would be any inducement i'd like to buy it from you of course i wouldn't ask you to take it off right now but if you would leave it at the clerk's desk here i would call for it in half an hour the young lady made no reply instead she threw back her head and laughed heartily it ain't no joke lady abe continued as he laid three flimsy notes of the bank of france in her lap that's as good as american greenbacks the young lady ceased laughing for a minute hesitated between indignation and renewed mirth but at last her sense of humor conquered very well she said stay here for a few minutes half an hour later she returned with the dress wrapped up in a paper parcel how did you know i wouldn't go off with the money dress and all she asked as abe seized the package i took a chance lady he said like you're doing about the money which i gave you being good have no scruples on that score the young lady replied i had it examined at the clerk's office just now when m adolph kaufman levi bade farewell to mo abe leon and jaime saltzman at the guerre st lazare he uttered words of encouragement and cheer which failed to justify themselves after the four travellers embarkment at cherbourg you will have splendid weather he had declared it will be fine all the way over when the steamer passed out of the breakwater into the english channel she breasted a northeaster that lasted all the way to the banks even jaime saltzman went under and leon samet walked the swaying decks alone twice a day he poked his head into the stateroom occupied by mo griesman and abe potash for abe had thrown economy to the winds and had gone halves with mo in the largest outside room on board boys leon would ask ain't you gonna get up the air is fine on deck had he but known it mo griesman developed day by day with growing intensity that violent hatred for leon that the hopelessly seasick feel toward good sailors while toward abe who groaned unceasingly in the upper berth mo griesman evinced the affectionate interest that the poor sailor evinces in any one who suffers more keenly than himself at length nantucket lightship was passed and as the sea grew calmer two white-faced invalids that on close scrutiny might have been recognized by their oldest friends to be mo and abe tottered up the companionway and sank exhausted into the nearest deck chairs well mo leon cried as he bustled toward them 
smoking a large cigar and clad in a suit of immaculate white flannels so you're up again the silence with which mo received this remark ought to have warned leon but he plunged headlong to his fate we're now only twenty-four hours from new york he said and suppose i go downstairs and bring you up some of them styles which i got in paris you shouldn't trouble yourself mo said shortly why not leon inquired because for all i care mo replied viciously you could fire em overboard i would owe a buy from you a button what's the matter leon cried you know what's the matter mo continued you come every day into my stateroom and mock me yet because i'm sick i mock you leon exclaimed that's what i said mo continued and if you wouldn't take that cigar away from here i'll break your neck when i get on shore again leon backed away hurriedly and mo turned to abe am i right or wrong he said abe nodded he was incapable of audible speech but hour by hour he grew stronger until at dinner time he was able to partake of some soup and roast beef and even to listen with a wan smile to mo's caustic appraisement of leon samet's character finally after a good night's rest mo and abe awoke to find the engine stilled at quarantine they were saved the necessity of packing their trunks for the cogent reason that they had been physically unable to open them let alone unpack them hence they repaired at once to breakfast leon was already seated at the table and he hastily cancelled an order for yarmouth bloater and asked instead for a less fragrant dish good morning mo he said pleasantly mo turned to abe tomorrow morning at nine o'clock abe he said i would be down in your store to look over your line steward leon sammet cried never mind that steak i would take the bloater anyhow abe and mo breakfasted lightly on egg and toast and returned to their stateroom as they passed the battery say looky here mo abe said i want to show you something which i bought for you as a surprise the night before we left paris i got it right in the top of my suitcase here it wouldn't take a minute to show it to you abe was unstrapping his suitcase as he spoke and the next minute he shook out the gown he had purchased from the young lady of the cafe de la paix and exposed it to mo's admiring gaze how did you get a hold of that abe mo asked abe narrated his adventure at the grand hotel while mo gaped his astonishment i always thought you got a pretty good nerve abe he declared but this sure is the limit how much did you pay for it three hundred of them now uh, francs abe replied but i've been figuring out the cost of manufacturing and material and i could duplicate it in new york for forty dollars a garment you mean thirty-five dollars a garment don't you mo said no i don't abe replied i mean forty dollars a garment why do you say thirty-five dollars because at forty dollars a piece abe I could use for my Syracuse, Rochester, and Buffalo stores about fifty of these garments, and you ought to figure on at least five dollars profit on a garment. Well, maybe I'm figuring it a little too generous, you understand? So, if that goes, Mo, I will quote the selling price at, say, forty dollars a garment to you, Mo. Sure it goes, Mo said, and I'll be at your store tomorrow morning at nine o'clock to decide on sizes and shades. Abe's passage through the customs examination was accomplished with ease, for nearly all his Paris purchases were packed in the hold to be cleared by a custom-house broker. His stateroom baggage contained no dutiable articles, save the gown in question, and a few trinkets for Rosie, who was at the pier to greet him indeed she bestowed on him a series of kisses that re-echoed down the long pier and abe's pallor gave way to the sunburnt hue of his amused fellow-passengers and one of them abe recognized with a start the tanned features of the young lady of the cafe de la paix mo he said nudging greaseman 
there's your friend mo turned in the direction indicated by abe and his interested manner was not unnoticed by mrs potash how's your dear wife and daughter mr greaseman she said significantly i suppose you missed them a whole lot when mo assured her that he did she sniffed so violently that it might have been taken for a snort well abe he said at length I'll be going on to the Prince Clarence, and I'll see you in the store tomorrow morning. Goodbye, Mrs. Potash. Goodbye, Mrs. Potash replied, with an emphasis that implied good riddance. And then, as Mo disappeared toward the street, she sniffed again. It didn't take long for some loafers to forget their wives, she said. Well, Abe, Morris said after the first greetings had passed between them that afternoon. I'm glad to see you back in the store. You ain't half so glad to see me back, Morris, as I am that I should be back, Abe replied. Not that the trip ain't paid us, Morris, because I got a trunk full of samples on the way up here, which I assure you is a work of art. Sure, I know, Morris commented with just a tinge of bitterness in his tones. Paris is the place for styles. Us poor suckers over here don't know a thing about designing. Well, Morris, I'll tell you, Abe went on. You are a first-class A number one designer, I got to admit, and there ain't nobody that I consider as better as you in the whole garment trade. But, here he paused to unfasten his suitcase. But, Morris, he continued, I got here just one sample style which I brought it with me, Morris, and I think, Morris, you have got to agree with me. Such models we don't turn out on this side. Here he opened the suitcase, and carefully taking out the dress of the Café de la Paix, he spread it on a sample table. What do you think of that, Morris? he asked. Morris made no answer. He was gazing at the garment with bulging eyes, and beads of perspiration ran down his forehead. Abe, he gasped at length, where did you get that garment from? Before Abe could answer, the elevator door opened and a young lady stepped out. It was now Abe's turn to gasp, for the visitor was none other than the tanned and ruddy young person from the Café de la Paix. "'Good afternoon, Mr. Perlmutter,' she said. "'I've just got back.' "'Oh, good afternoon, Miss Smith,' Morris cried. "'I hope I'm not interrupting you,' she continued. "'Not at all,' Morris said. "'Not at all.' Then a wave of recollection came over him, and he muttered a half-smothered exclamation. "'Abe! Miss Smith!' he almost shouted, and then he sat down. "'Say, looky here, Abe. What is all this, anyway? Miss Smith comes in here and—' "'Well, upon my word,' Miss Smith interrupted, "'if it isn't the gentleman from the Café de la Paix, and of all things, there is the very dress.' Abe shrugged his shoulders. That's right, Miss whatever your name is, Abe admitted. That's the dress, and since I paid you sixty dollars for it, I don't think you got any kick coming. Sixty dollars, Morris cried. Why, that dress as a sample garment only cost us twenty two fifty to make up. Cost us? Abe repeated. As a sample garment? What are you talking about? I'm talking about this, Abe, Morris replied. That dress is the self-same garment which I designed it, and which you says was rotten and freaky, and which I gave it to Miss Smith here for a present, and which you paid Miss Smith sixty dollars for. And here is the sixty dollars now, Miss Smith broke in. I hurried here as fast as I could give it to you, Mr. Perlmutter. One moment, Abe said. I don't know who this young lady is or nothing, but do you mean to told me that this here dress which I bought in Paris was made up right here in our place? Here, Abe, Morris said, I want to show you something. Here is from the same goods a garment, and them goods, as you know, we got it from the Hamsucket Mills. So far what I hear at the Hamsucket Mills don't sell their output in Paris, am I right or wrong? Abe nodded slowly. Well, Mr. Perlmutter, Miss Smith said, here's your sixty dollars. I've got to get back to my patient. You know that I went to Paris with a rheumatic case, and I've left the old gentleman in charge of a friend. I came here to settle up. Excuse me, Abe said. I ain't been introduced to this young lady yet. Why, I thought you knew her, Morris said. This is Miss Smith, the trained nurse, which was so good to my Minnie when my Abby was born. 
is that so abe cried well miss smith you should take that sixty dollars and keep it because morris on the way over i sold mo greaseman fifty garments of that there style of yours at forty dollars apiece you don't say morris cried you don't say so well all i gotta say is miss smith in the first place if abe wouldn't have told you to keep that sixty dollars i sure would have done so and in the second place i want you to come in here next week and pick out half a dozen dresses ain't that right abe yeah, i bet you that's right morris we wouldn't take no for an answer abe replied and you should also leave us your name and address smith smith because got so hootin if i should be sick you understand i don't want nobody else to nurse me but you say looky here abe morris said the following morning that trunk full of power samples which the custom house says we would get this morning ain't come yet abe clapped his partner on the shoulder and grinned happily what do i care morris he said for my part they should never come they ain't got no use for paris fashions at all styles which morris perlmutter originates is good enough for me because i always said it morris you're a crackerjack high grade a number one designer end of chapter two section three of abe and morris this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org abe and morris being further adventures of potash and perlmutter by montague glass chapter three dead men's shoes part one there goes that sucker aaron kronberg from port sullivan a potash declared to his partner morris perlmutter as they looked from the windows of their showroom to the opposite sidewalk some four stories below ain't it funny that fellow would never buy from us a dollar's worth more goods the reason ain't hard to find abe morris replied once a garment buyer gets into the hands of a competitor like leon sammet it's all off i bet you leon tells him we're all kinds of crooks and swindlers what could you expect from a cutthroat like leon sammet that fellow's no good and his father before him is also a thief i know his people from the old country yet one was worser as the other well there's nothing the matter with aaron's cousin alex kronberg anyhow morris observed that fellow does a fine business in bridgetown and Samet brothers can no more take his trade away from us than they could fly that ain't our fault morris abe rejoined Samet brothers is fly enough to do anything morris but the way aaron kronberg hates alex kronberg if they was to sell alex a single garment you understand aaron would never buy from them a dollar's worth more goods so long as he lived he ain't a disgrace them two fellows as such enemies abe alex ain't no enemy morris abe said it's aaron what's the enemy alex don't trouble himself at all he told me so himself but that's the way it goes morris moshe kronberg hillel kronberg and elkin kronberg was three brothers which you don't see nowadays at all more like friends than brothers morris hillel died ten years ago and i thought it would broke moshe's heart he looked after hillel's widow and hillel's boy alex because moshe never married morris he was a born uncle then when elkin died a year later you never saw a fellow so broke up like moshe in all my life he goes to work and sends elkin's boy aaron to business college and elkin's widow he takes to live with hillel's widow all together with himself and the two boys in that house of his on madison street for three years they lived that way and in the rest of the house moshe couldn't keep any tenants at all at last he gives aaron a couple of thousand dollars and alex the same and aaron buys up a store in port sullivan and alex goes up to bridgetown what became of the widows abe morris asked i don't know is elkin's widow living now out or not abe said but moshe told me hillel's widow wants to get married again and alex comes up to him and says he should give the old lady anyhow a thousand dollars moshe wants to know what for and alex tells him he owes it from hillel's estate yet a couple of thousand dollars and did he morris inquired suppose he did abe replied he is entitled to it after what he puts up with during them three years they live together well moshe and alex gets right away fighting about it and i guess alex would have sued moshe in the courts yet only the old lady goes to work and dies on him all of a sudden but why is aaron and alex such enemies abe 
Morris asked. Well, it's like this, Morris. Aaron and Alex is good friends, until Uncle Moshe cuts Alex out of his will. You see, Aaron and Alex is the only two relations which Moshe got at all, so naturally when Aaron thinks he is coming in for the whole thing, he begins to get sore at Alex. And the more Aaron thinks that the old man really ought to leave half to Alex, the more he gets sore at Alex. The whole business is dead wrong, Abe, Morris commented. In the first place, the old man ain't got no right to leave his money only to Aaron. And in the second place, Aaron ain't got no right to feel sore at Alex. And furthermore, Alex ought to go around and see his uncle once in a while when he's in New York, in the third place. Well, why don't you tell him so this afternoon, Morris? Abe said. Alex is staying up at the Prince Clarence since last night already, and he said he would be sure down here this afternoon. I will do so, Morris replied firmly. Go ahead, Abe said. Only one thing I got to tell you, Morris. There is some customers which would stand anything, Morris. You could ship them two garments short in every order. You can send them goods which ain't no more like the sample than bread is like matzes. You could overcharge them in your statements. You could even draw on them one day after their account is due. And still, they would buy goods from you. But as soon as you start to butt into their family affairs, Morris, that's the finish, Morris. They'd leave you like a shot. Alex Kronberg wouldn't take it so particular, Morris retorted. He knows I'm only doing it for his own good. Oh, if you're only going to do it for his own good, Morris, then that's something again, Abe said. Because in that case, we would not only lose him for a customer, Morris, but we would also make an enemy of him for life. You shouldn't worry, Morris replied as he put on his hat, preparatory to going out to lunch. I know how to take care of a customer, all right. Nevertheless, Morris cogitated his partner's advice throughout the entire lunch hour, and over his dessert he commenced to formulate a tentative plan for restoring Alex Kronberg to his inheritance. Two cups of coffee and a second helping of mon cake aided the process of celebrating this scheme, so that when Morris returned to his place of business it was nearly two o'clock. Abe, he said as he entered, I've been thinking over this here matter about Alex Kronberg, and I ain't going to talk to Alex about it at all. You know what I'm going to do? Abe grabbed his hat and turned to Morris with a savage glare. Sure, I know what you're going to do, Morris. Potash bellowed belligerently. Henceforth, from tomorrow on, you're going to do this, Morris. You're going to lunch after I am coming back. I could drop dead from hunger already, for all you care. I got a stomach too, Morris, and don't you forget it. Moshe Kronberg lived on the ground floor of his own tenement house on Madison Street. And to say that Aaron Kronberg worshipped the ground his uncle walked on would be to utter the literal truth. Well, uncle, how do you feel today? Aaron inquired. The morning after Abe and Morris had so thoroughly discussed the Kronberg family relations. I could feel a whole lot better, Aaron, and I could feel a whole lot worse, Moshe Kronberg replied. Them suckers has been after me again. Which ones are they now? Aaron asked, his curiosity aroused. An orphan asylum, Moshe replied. The gall which some people got it, Aaron. Honestly, you wouldn't believe it at all. They want me I should give them two hundred and fifty dollars. I told them time enough when I would die, Gotzelhutten. What are you talking nonsense, Uncle Moshe? Aaron broke in. You ain't going to die for a long time yet. And anyhow, Uncle Moshe, if people goes to work and has children in which they couldn't support while they're living even, why should they get any of your money to support them even after you're dead? No one asks them suckers they should have children, ain't I right? Sure, you are right, Uncle Moshe agreed. Hospitals also, Aaron. If I got one hospital bothering me, I must got a dozen. Why should I bother myself with hospitals, Aaron? A low-life gambler hangs around liquor saloons all times of the night till he gets sick, you understand? Then he must go to a hospital and get well on my money yet? I see myself. What hospital was that? Aaron inquired. The Mount Hebron Hospital, 
uncle mosher replied there's the catalogue now they are sending it to me this morning only aaron sees the annual report and list of donating members of the hospital and opened it at the letter k you know what i think uncle aaron cried i think that alex kronberg puts him up to asking you for money alex puts him up to it mosher repeated what for should alex do such a thing here let me show you aaron cried alex himself gives them fake as five dollars here it is in black and white alex kronberg bridgetown pennsylvania five dollars uncle mosher adjusted a pair of eyeglasses to his broad flat nose and perused the record of his nephew's extravagance with bulging eyes well what do you think for a sucker like that he exclaimed i tell you the honest truth uncle aaron said i don't want to say nothing about alex at all but the way the fellow is acting just because he does a little good business in his store honestly it's a disgrace he sends my mother for ten dollars a birthday present too do i need that sucker he should give my mother birthday presents he's throwing away his money left and right and the first thing you know he's coming to you borrowing yet he should save himself the trouble uncle Moshe declared his tongue should be hanging out of his mouth with hunger aaron and i wouldn't give him oh so one cent aaron's face broke into a thousand wrinkles as he beamed with satisfaction well uncle he said i must be going i got a whole lot of things to do today take care of yourself don't worry about me aaron's uncle mosher replied i could take care of myself all right you wouldn't drink maybe a glass of schnapps or something before you go no all right he always delayed his proffer of hospitality until aaron was on the front stoop after the latter had turned the corner of Pike Street, Uncle Moshe lingered to take the morning air. A fresh breeze from the southwest brought with it a faint odor of salt herring and onions from the grocery store next door, while from the bakery across the street came the fragrant evidence of a large batch of kummelbrot. He sighed contently and turned to re-enter the house but even as he did so he wheeled about in response to the greeting how do you do mr kronberg the speaker was none other than morris perlmutter who had tossed on his pillow until past midnight devising a plan for approaching uncle mosha in a plausible manner now that his quarry had fallen so opportunely within his grasp morris's face wreathed itself in smiles of such amiability that uncle mosher grew at once suspicious you got the advantage from me he said why don't you know me morris cooed i think uncle mosher replied guardedly i seen you once it before somewheres you're a collector for a hospital or an orphan asylum or some such sucker game ain't it morris laughed mirthlessly his discarded plan for renewing his acquaintance with uncle mosher had involved the pretense that he was seeking to interest the old gentleman in the home for chronic invalids independent order matai aaron of which fraternity morris was an active member and uncle mosher's apparent distaste for organized charity proved rather disconcerting you're a poor gasser mr kronberg he said then you are connected with some charity ain't it uncle mosher continued morris denied it indignantly godsell houghton he said my name is mr perlmutter and i'm in the cloak and suit business oh i remember now uncle mosher cried the news that morris was no charity worker restored him to high good humor i remember you perfect now he said shaking hands effusively with morris you got a partner by the name potash ain't it that's right morris replied and what brings you over here in this nachbarschaft uncle mosher inquired morris looked from uncle mosher to the tarnished brass plate on the side of the tenement house door it read as follows m kronberg real estate the fact is morris said i'm coming to see you in a business way if you've got time i'd like to say a little something to you come inside uncle mosher grunted 
he thought he discerned a furtive timidity in his visitor's manner strongly indicative of an impending touch in the first place he began after morris was seated i ain't got so much money which people think i got it i never thought you did said morris and uncle moshe glared in response but i ain't no beggar neither you understand he retorted i got a little something left anyhow sure i know morris agreed but what have you got or what you ain't got is neither here nor there i'm coming over this morning to ask you something a question here he paused he had not yet determined what that question would be and it occurred to him that unless it were sufficiently momentous to account for his presence on the lower east side during the busiest hours of a business day uncle moshe would show him the door go ahead and ask it then uncle moshe broke in impatiently i couldn't sit here all day the fact is morris said slowly and then his mind reverted to the brass plate on the door and at once he proceeded with renewed confidence the fact is i'm coming over here to ask you something a question which a friend of mine would like to buy a property on the east side a property uncle moshe repeated a property is something else again what for a property would your friend like to buy it a fine property morris replied a property like you got it here but this here property ain't for sale uncle moshe said i got the house here now since eighteen ninety already and i guess i would keep it sure i know that's all right morris went on but i thought even if you wouldn't want to sell the house you know such a whole lot about real estate mr kronberg it could help us out a little the hard lines about uncle moshe's mouth relaxed into a smile well when it comes to real estate he said i ain't a fool exactly you understand that's what i was told morris continued a friend of mine he says to me if anyone could tell you about real estate moshe kronberg could there's a man he says which his opinion you could trust in it anything what he says is so if the astors and the gullets would know about east side real estate what the fellow knows understand me instead of their hundreds of millions they would have thousands of millions already uncle moshe fairly beamed yes mr kronberg morris went on without taking a breath he says to me you should go and see uncle moshe he's a gentleman and he would treat you all right but i says to him i get no right to butt in your uncle moshe you see alex i says alex uncle moshe cried did alex kronberg send you here that's who it was morris replied then all i can say is uncle moshe thundered you should go right back to alex and tell him from me that i says any friend of his which he comes to me looking for information about real estate he's lucky i don't kick him into the street yet he jumped up from his chair and opened the door leading into the public hall go on he roared out from my house morris rose leisurely to his feet and pulled a large cigar from his pocket if that's the way you feel about it mr kronberg shun good i wouldn't bother you any more at the same time mr kronberg if ever you should want to sell the house you understand let me know that's all as he passed out of the door he laid the cigar on a side table and its bright red band immediately caught the eye of uncle moshe he pounced on it and was about to hurl it after his departing visitor when something about the smoothness of the wrapper made him pause five minutes later he lolled back in a horsehair covered rocker and puffed contentedly at morris's cigar after all he said i might get a good price for the house anyway from moshe kronberg's tenement house on madison street to the cloak and suit district at nineteenth street and fifth avenue is less than two miles as the crow flies but morris perlmutter's journey uptown was accomplished in less direct fashion he spent over half an hour in an antiquated horse car and by the time the broadway car to which he transferred had reached madison square it was nearly twelve o'clock as he walked down nineteenth street he almost collided with abe whose face wore a frown say looky here morris he cried what kind of business is this here you are just getting downtown and i'm going out to lunch already sure i know morris retorted 
you think of nothing but your stomach believe me abe i worked hard enough this morning work nothing abe rejoined you've been up to some monkey business morris otherwise why should moshe kronberg telephone us just now he thought the matter over since you left there and he would be up to see you this afternoon already what morris cried did moshe kronberg telephone that himself all right morris then i'm a liar abe exploded i'm telling you with my own ears i heard him i believe you abe morris said soothingly don't hurry back from your lunch i got lots of time i would hurry back o to not as i please morris abe retorted as he trudged off toward hammersmith's restaurant there he ministered to his outraged feelings with a steaming dish of gefulte rinderburst and it was not until he had sopped up the last drop of gravy with a piece of rye bread that he became conscious of a stranger sitting opposite to him excuse me said the latter you got a little soup on the lapel of your coat that ain't soup abe explained as he dipped his napkin in the glass of ice water and started to remove the stain that's a little gefilte rinderbrust which they fix it so thin and watery nowadays it might just as well be soup the way it's always getting all over your clothes things ain't the same like they used to be the stranger remarked twenty twenty-five years ago a fellow could get a meal down on canal street for a quarter understand me which it was really something you could say was remarkable take any of them places gifkins or wasabowers ain't i right did you used to went to gifkins abe asked i should say his v a v replied when i was a boy of fifteen i am eating always regular by gifkins me too i used to eat a whole lot by gifkins abe said in fact i think must have seen you there i shouldn't wonder the stranger continued at the time i was working by my old man baum right across from gifkins he was my uncle already you are old man baum's nephew abe exclaimed how could that be old man baum only got one brother nathan which he got mixed up in a railroad accident near knoxville he was always up to some monkey business that fellow olaf Sholom. sure i know the stranger continued but old man baum got also one sister my mother mrs gershon you must remember my father sam gershon worked for years by rector as a cutter my name is max gershon why sure i do abe said shaking hands with his new-found acquaintance so you're son of old man gershon do you live here in new york mr gershon no i live in johnsville texas mr gershon replied this is my first visit north in twenty-five years mr mr potash abe said mr potash gershon continued i'm feeling pretty lonesome i can tell you all my folks is dead my father my mother my two uncles and there ain't a soul here in new york which remembers me at all is that so abe commented with ready sympathy yes mr potash gershon said when i was a boy i done a full thing when i was sixteen years old already i run away from home because my father licked me and i never wrote to him or sent him no word to him until it was too late you see up to five years since i didn't done so good everything seemed to went against me mr potash but lately i'm doing a fine business for a small place like johnsonville and today i got the best store down there you don't say so abe cried so i thought last month instead i would go to dallas or fort worth like i usually done i would come straight on to new york and not only buy my fall goods but also give the good old folks a surprise and what do i find everybody's dead mr gershon pressed a handkerchief to his eyes you shouldn't take on so abe said leaning across the table and placing his hand on gershon's arm it's the way of the world mr gershon and i could assure you we got the finest line of garments in our store which is first-class stuff up to the minute and prices and everything just right mr gershon wiped his eyes you must excuse me mr potash he said my feelings has got the better of me that's all right abe murmured here is our card and you should positively come up to see us even if you wouldn't buy from us a button mr gershon it would be a pleasure for us to see you in our place i would sure be there mr gershon said as he pocketed the card waiter abe called put this here gentleman's check on mine and bring us two of them thirty-cent cigars so eagerly 
did morris await the advent of uncle moshe kronberg in potash and perlmutter's store that he even omitted to notice his partner's prolonged absence at lunch and when abe returned to unfold the narrative of his meeting with a prospective customer morris heard it without interest the feller is a number one morris abe said i stopped off to see sam fetter at the kosciuszko bank and sam sent me to the associated information bureau he is rated twenty to thirty thousand credit good yes morris replied tell me abe did moshe kronberg say just when he would be here what are you wasting your time about moshe kronberg for abe retorted we got enough to do we should pick out a few good styles to show gershon morris nodded absently his thoughts were centered on a short old man with close-cropped beard who at that very moment was turning the corner of fifth avenue and nineteenth street simultaneously aaron kronberg ran across the street from samet brothers doorway and clapped the old gentleman on the shoulder hello uncle moshe he cried what are you doing around here couldn't i come uptown once in a while if i would want to uncle moshe replied somewhat testily sure sure aaron kronberg hastened to say gee it i never eat in the middle of the day uncle moshe said i am up here on business on business aaron repeated what for business i think i sold the house moshe replied for one brief moment aaron gazed at his uncle and then he linked his arm in that of the old man come over to twenty-third street and drink anyhow a cup of coffee he said and ten minutes later they entered an enameled brick dairy restaurant you say you think you sold the house aaron said after a waitress had served them uncle moshe nodded he was emptying a cup of coffee in long noisy inhalations and at the same time consuming cheese sandwiches with uncommonly keen appetite for a man who had never ate in the middle of the day yes aaron uncle moshe said as he emerged all dripping from the cup i think i sold the house and i guess i would have another cup of coffee go ahead aaron replied but what if you want to sell the house uncle moshe it brings you in anyhow a good income a good income for some people aaron but for me not what is one thousand a year aaron one thousand a year uncle is a whole lot especially to a man like you what lives simple my living expenses is very little i admit aaron uncle moshe replied after he had disposed of the second cup of coffee with noises approximating a bathtub full of soapy water disappearing down the waste pipe i don't make no fuss about my living aaron but you gotta remember aaron that a man couldn't live on living expenses alone once in a while a fellow likes to take a little flyer in the market and try and make a few dollars ain't it what aaron exclaimed that was a phase of his uncle's character that he had never exposed before yes aaron uncle moshe continued living ain't only having a room to sleep in and food to eat aaron other things is living aaron stocks is living and auction pinnacle is also living and going once in a while on theatre is living too aaron i may be an old man aaron but i ain't dead yet aaron's pale face grew almost ghastly at these shocking disclosures and when uncle moshe concluded his audacious creed with a furtive wink his nephew visibly started but you got plenty other money to invest in the stock market without you would sell the house uncle moshe he said have i uncle moshe rejoined that's news to me aaron you see in nineteen seven was a big panic and some stocks is better as others them which ain't aaron they went and gone so low aaron they ain't never come back again and perhaps never will might you heard something about it in port sullivan maybe ten thousand dollars i dropped on them suckers in wall street aaron uncle moshe smiled blandly at his nephew who grasped the edge of the table to steady his whirling senses but what's the use talking uncle moshe continued what is vorbi is vorbi and i guess i would have another cup of coffee you had enough coffee aaron cried sternly so you gone and dropped your money on stocks eh uncle moshe shrugged and extended one palm in 
philosophic resignation. It was my own money, Aaron, he said. I didn't stole it. This ain't no time for making jokes, Uncle Moshe, Aaron retorted. Who was it you was going to sell the house to? Maybe you know him, Uncle Moshe said. It's a fellow by the name of Morris Perlmutter. Aaron Kronberg's pallor gave way to a flood of crimson, and for a moment he choked incoherently as he gazed at Uncle Moshe in amazement. Why, that fellow Perlmutter is a friend of Alex, he gasped at length. Sure, I know, Uncle Moshe replied, but even if he is a friend of Alex, his money ain't counterfeit. But he'd rob you of your shirt, Uncle Moshe, Aaron exclaimed. He's a dangerous fellow. I'm used to dangerous fellows, Aaron, Uncle Moshe answered calmly. I told you before I dropped ten thousand in Wall Street. Yes, and if you had sold us here house, Uncle Moshe, you'd drop ten thousand more. Not ten thousand, Aaron. I only got eight thousand equity in the house. Again, Aaron stared at his uncle. Do you mean to tell me you only got eight thousand dollars in the world? He groaned. The world is a pretty big place, Aaron, Uncle Moshe said. But I wouldn't lie to you anyhow. Eight thousand is the figure. Then all I can say is, Uncle Moshe, before you had got to go begging on the streets yet, you would better sell the house and come to live with me up in Port Sullivan. Uncle Moshe shrugged once more. I'll tell you the truth, Aaron, he said. I was going to suggest that to you myself yet. So let's get right off and see this here Pearl Mutter, and we'll talk about Port Sullivan later. Not by a damn sight, Aaron declared as he rose from his chair and grasped his uncle firmly by the arm. You come with me, and we'll sell this house to a feller I know. End of section 3